Hello, this is Vivica Williams, and you're watching Head to Head. Ukraine will not be extending an agreement with Russia called the Treaty on Friendship, Cooperation, and Partnership. That agreement was due to be automatically extended this autumn, but for obvious reasons, it will not be renewed. So what will change once the treaty is discontinued? To talk more about this, we're joined in the studio today by Maxim Yakolev. Director of the School for Policy Analysis at the National University of Kiev Mahila Academy. Hello, thank Hello. you for joining us, Maxim. Thank you for inviting. So, before we talk about what will change after the discontinuation, let's talk about the treaty itself. So, it was signed in 1997, about uh, 21 years ago, and uh, as I understand. It, it, it's supposed to ensure the rights each of each citizens receive the respect from each countries about borders. So what exactly did it entail and how was it supposed to be uh, implemented? Well, I have to say that this is a normal practice for many countries to have different bilateral agreements, especially mm -hmm. that types of corporations, they usually cover, as you uh, mentioned, a bright variety of uh, scope, different um, uh, so to say, spheres of relationship, like also the rights of the citizens, cooperation within science, sometimes even more so. So this is a traditional practice, and Ukraine has a number of bilateral um, agreements with different countries, and this is a set a normal practice. The problem with this particular agreement is, as many Ukrainian observers, also scientists, say that if we call it um, an agreement about friendship and cooperation, having an agreement with friendship and cooperation still active with a country which is uh, involved in an active war with Ukraine, so, and uh, being towards Ukrainians, you know, we sometimes even misuse this term aggressor, saying that Russia is actually the country that annexed a part of our territory. Uh, they support both in terms of military and they have open military aggression and occupation in the east of Ukraine. So in that terms, usually situations like that, I mean annexations and involvement in active warfare and actually... Um, in actually being the cause for a war on a territory of the country mm. is something that is actually never covered by any agreement which will be called something like friendship and cooperation. Mm. So this was definitely not uh, within the scopes of the agreement, but I think that it's, on the other hand, uh, those who are interested can Google open it and read it, so to have a, a general uh, idea and understanding. But just, you know, in Ukraine, the second problem is that many Ukrainians think with this um, binary dichotomy of saying that this is our victory, Peremoha, and this is Zrada. So <laughs> this is not something that this agreement was not supposed to be like that. This is normal practice, signed between many different countries, especially when these countries are neighbors. And so it, it's in a sense, it's kind of insulting to keep in place a type of a agreement with the name Friendship, Cooperation and Partnerships exactly. in its terms. What, uh, what will what's going to be any changes that we see after the ending of this agreement, because it usually automatically renews every 10 years, and unless one party decides to discontinue it. Mm -hmm. So is this more of a symbolic action, or will there be actually, we see some types of changes in the relationship, if there could be anything that would um, be worse? Actually, a good question, if uh, the symbolism, if we discontinue this agreement, and if we do not suggest anything new, because sometimes it is also a practice, conventional, well, depends upon how often that happens, but still, some countries do change, they do amendments to different agreements, and they renew them in different formats. That can also happen. But in case of Ukraine, there is, as I say, not much meaning in continuing a treaty which claims to be a treaty on, on the friendship and the cooperation uh, when this country is involved in active um, actions of war against Ukraine. But on the other hand, this the topic also relates, if you might have heard, this is something we have already discussed in Ukraine about the, the problem with the transit of, um, um, of vehicles and different types of communications with Russia, for example, the railway connection, if we can really stop it between Moscow and Kyiv, but we have to understand that on one, on, on one hand, it is not going to change much within the international relations between Ukraine. I mean, uh, we can expect that there will be changes for people and citizens, and this is the case for Ukrainian state to be able to protect our citizens who are also working in Russia, as working migrants. But on the other hand, we have to uh, understand that many of those who work in Russia do not only low-skilled and medium-skilled job, but also the people who work in Russia because they couldn't uh, find a better place to work in Ukraine or in Western European countries. So, um, to, to sum up my answer, Answer. On, on one hand, it is not going to change much because there is really no friendship as such. On the other hand, we have to think of protecting uh, our citizens. 
also one point, for example, cooperation, there are certain fields where there is no cooperation as such, for example, within the academia, it is really difficult. So as a, am I, since I'm working for a state on the public university, it is actually not allowed to join or travel to Russia uh, officially to any conference. That mm -hmm. can be done on private initiative, but there are certain fields where there is mm -hmm. no cooperation anyway. So, And so, so then we're looking at maybe some type of uh, bilateral changes that are not going to be felt by the average person. I hope so. This is my hope. But also that people who are working in Russia as migrants, who really do not constitute a political threat to Russian regime as such, um, how is it going, how Russia is going to play this card is the next question. Absolutely. Uh, definitely Russia is going to use this for their propaganda because they actually, they do not recognize themselves to be this party in conflict. Mm -hmm. So uh, on the other hand, we know um, this is always this is hanging above Ukraine, uh, also in relationship to other Western partners, for example, the United States or European Union. Is if they introduce a number of sanctions against Russia to basically punish Russia for its action against Ukraine, the next question is: We are punishing somebody whom you are having friendship relations with. Right. <laughs> this is also not uh, normal. It's right. Absolutely. There's a lot of symbolism in this true. action. This is true. And the other thing we look at, uh, looking back at what's in this treaty. I mean, we know that it's a lot more symbolic, but there are also uh, some of the main issues that are brought up. For uh, Let's listen for a second. Uh, I have this clip from what uh, uh, Irina Hiroshinko said, the first deputy chair of mm -hmm. Verhubna Rada, and she talked about the reasons why that this is an impossible to keep. Let's have a listen to that clip. There is no question of any disillusion, denunciation, because in 2014, when the treaty was in force, the Russian Federation flagrantly violated it. And it must be responsible for the occupation and annexation, for the violation of the border and of the treaty's key articles. But to prolong the effect of the treaty is really impossible, because there is neither friendship nor cooperation, but war and Russian aggression. So speaking specifically about this, I want to talk a little bit about this idea with the violation of borders, mm. and that's brought up in here. Is there? Do you feel there's some sense that by by uh, on the first hand by uh, discontinuing this symbolic treaty, this is really going to allow Ukraine to be able to take a more proactive or uh, aggressive <laughs> stance towards these violations of borders? Hopefully. You know, my problem is usually with these things, I'm a political scientist by education and also within my professional field, but I think uh, that should be commented by an expert in international law. So this is a special legal issue. From political perspective, however, we can say that definitely if there is a violation of any point of this agreement, and this is something in Ukraine, you know, everybody has heard about the, the Budapest Memorandum, and right. if, <laughs> if there is a violation of any international treaty of that scope, this is actually for nuclear security, not only in Europe, but on the on the scale of the whole world, if that is not happening, and what's, what happens next. The same with this treaty on, on um, violation of borders, and this, this, all these details, which I repeat should be commented by a lawyer within this right. legal, things like that, but um, from a political perspective, this should be a definite sign that Ukraine really states its position. And politics is very important when we don't know uh, whose ideas we encounter, uh, how we are, how we are going to counteract this Russian propaganda, things like this. These symbolic statements, they also play a role. Okay. And on the other hand, what is also important, this should be thought of the f for the future, because Ukraine cannot get rid of Russia physically. Right. Russia is our neighbor. Right. For some countries, like you know, in Canada, if you sometimes even listen to Canadian political news, you can say that Russia, uh, sorry, um, United States are neighbors. So you cannot do right. something about that. So for the, for the future, Ukraine is really important to develop a certain attitude, a certain position, and maybe I would rephrase your question using aggression as a positive. Sometimes aggression is a positive emotion when they say we cannot do it any longer. So I'm fed up with the situation, we need to do some changes, and in that understanding, aggression is something positive. Yes. When you're really angry, and angry, um, I mean being really eager to do something. Yes. And this is something I hope for the future of Ukraine. And one last question, and this is maybe not in your sphere, but in my research and looking in this, and, and I and my colleagues were quite shocked to see that Ukraine has yet to ratify uh, and de the complete demarcation of its border between Russia and, you, and uh, the country. So there's still areas that, as mm -hmm. late as 2013, there's still discussion as into which part 
is used, which part is in Russia, which part is in Ukraine. True. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping and would like to see this. Do you foresee that this is going to be something that they political from a political standpoint that uh, Parliament may look at addressing in the near future? You know, a couple of things, because we have scarcity of time now, but I would love for Ukraine to have the situation that in Europe, when sometimes you walk between the Netherlands, Belgium and Germany, you just walk on the street and you really re recognize a border unless you specifically read a sign or something yeah. and you see no borders. But this is a good indicator. You once understand that you have a border once it's violated by somebody. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Otherwise, you live in a country and peacefully. Uh, from from the perspective of conspiracy theories, there are a lot of them in Ukraine, but they're quite different to what we know in Europe and United, in the United States. We can say that this was potentially planned by Russia to do an annexation, and that's that's why they they actually hesitated to demarcate and recognize the borders. But huh. this conspiracy <laughs> theories, <laughs> this is conspiratorial attitude. But more realistic one, and this is also something about being very symbolic. For Russia, independence of Ukraine has always been a problem. Yes. Within the Russian discourse and for Russian propaganda, Ukraine is a very important part. Also, what Russians perceive to be their heritage, by, like you know, the of Kiev and things yes, like that. And, and appropriation of exactly. Lord, Mary, this, yeah. Definitely. That's why to have a, a border, a strict border, and saying that this now is a completely independent country. We respect its border. And this is something, this entity is now separated and its entity has its own political rights, like to join NATO or be part of any international organization. I think that uh, apart for legal issues and apart for all conspirological stuff, it is very difficult for Russia to recognize that this country is independent, has its own rights and uh, has its own vision for its future, potentially not related to this concept of Ruski Mir Russian world. Yeah. And I think that could be said to be the, the heart of the issue. True. The I, I, issue. That I have to agree with, yes. Thank you so much. I wish Thank we had you. more time with you today. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you. And this was Maxim Yakolev, director of the School for Policy Analysts at the National University of Kiev Mahila Academy. Thank you for watching UATV and stay tuned for more great programming.